Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to invite you to a reception after the performance. Just downstairs in the Great Hall, do you come and have a drink. Um, so this performance is about how gossip creates reputations. And we'll be hearing examples of slanderous and gossipy songs and words, actionable words, from six, six centuries of European culture. And what this suggests, we think, is that gossip is instrumental. It can have an effect on the world. While moralists may de denigrate it as trivial, inconsequential, basically meaningless, gossip has the power to make or to break a person's reputation, particularly perhaps in the very public life of pre-modern Europe. So we're going to hear songs and words that reflect very consciously on how gossip spreads, how rumour kind of travels through a community, and how gossip can build up and bring down a reputation. Suggesting that reputations are fabricated in this way, of course, does not make them any less real. On the contrary, because they are constructions that involve a group of people, reputations suggest that there is a real sense in which part of our identity is in the hands or rather perhaps in the mouths of others. Um, before we start, I'd like to introduce the performers. From the music department, four wonderful singers, Matthew O'Keefe, Joey Edwards, Miles Ashdown, and Matthew Norris, and they'll be singing for us. And then to perform the spoken words of 17th century slanders, um, students from the MA in Early Modern History Michelle Barnett, Esme Dawson, Katrina Hansen, and Jackie Simard. And we're going to start, our first stop is in 12th century France with the Troubadours. So, my name is Simon Gaunt, and I teach medieval literature in the French department. Um, and my colleague uh, Emma and I are just going to introduce the lyrics that you're going to hear. So there are over 2,000 surviving troubadour lyrics, and we think usually of the lovesick troubadour serenading uh, his lady, but almost half of the songs that survive are satirical, political, or parodic. And many of these silentes, as they're called, cast aspersions, sometimes scurrilous, about public figures. One example among many is Guillaume de Vegeda uh, and his songs about Arnaud de Prechens, uh, the Bishop of Urgell, who, we learn rather graphically, is hung like a mule, is an ardent rapist of noble ladies, and even more ardent rapist of young men, several whom, of whom are named in Guillaume's songs, and has questionable body, bodily hygiene. And these songs are copied in exactly the same manuscripts as the love songs. So song is a means of spreading news and of rumor, of casting aspersions, making and breaking reputations, as well as a form of entertainment. It also seems that when news travelled through song, it travelled fast. So the story that we're going to focus on today uh, occurs in 1146, when Eleanor, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the Queen of France, and one of the raciest figures of the 12th century, went with her husband, Louis VII, on the Second Crusade. Theirs was notoriously not a happy uh, marriage. She apparently disliked the French court found her husband dull, which he almost certainly was, and in over 12, nine years of marriage, she'd only crucially produced two daughters. Now, it's not entirely clear what happened while Eleanor and Louis were staying with her uncle, Raymond, Raymond of Antioch, at his court on their way to Jerusalem, but the inference in the historical sources is that the relationship between Eleanor and her uncle was improper. And it does seem that Louis had to remove her by force, in other words, to kidnap her, in order to, in order to oblige her to continue with him to Jerusalem. Whatever did happen, the marriage, which was already on the rocks, broke down definitively on their return to Europe. Ele Eleanor then immediately married the one person in the world most likely to piss Louis, her ex-husband, off, Henry of Anjou, who went on to become King of England in 1154, they had eight children together, including four sons, and although their marriage was also stormy, Henry locked her up for 12 years. Um, the rest, as they say, is history. This is the foundation of the so-called Angevin 
of empire. Now, what is clear is that the news of whatever Eleanor got up to in Antioch reached Western Europe within a few months. How, we're not entirely sure, but the Queen of France's misbehavior in Antioch was the subject of song in France as early as 1148. And one example is the Marker Brew song that we're going to hear, Cortez Amenuel Comensal, where the woman who takes two or three lovers uh, in, I think it's the fourth stanza, is almost certainly a thinly veiled reference to Eleanor, in which case the invitation to the French to pay particular attention to the song and so that it would cheer their hearts is almost certainly laced with sarcasm. Now this song is dedicated to Geoffrey Rudel and sent to him Ultramar. So this is an example of a song being sent over a long distance with a message of some kind. Um, so Ultramar, which is to say, while he is still on the Second Crusade, in the entourage of said Eleanor and Louis, and Cortés Amenuel Comensar is a wicked parody um, of Jalfrey's very famous and mellifluous courtly lyrics. It was Jalfrey who coined the famous Amour de Loin, or Love from a Far, motif, according to which the troubadour falls hopelessly in love with a lady of great nobility and worth without ever having seen her, simply on the basis of a description of her beauty. In Can Lurius de la Fontana, the Jaufri lyric that we're going to hear, he runs through the entire gamut of courtly commonplaces. He's moved to sing by the nightingale, he loves his lady from afar, this is the Amours de Terra Londana at the beginning of the second stanza, he thinks he's going to die of desire and longing if she doesn't assuage his pain. Finally, he sends her a message, en cantan, in plana, in plana lengua romana, so, uh, solely in song, in the plain romance tongue. Song here is the means of expressing love, but it also pri provides the means to love. Now, Jalfre is precisely the kind of sugary troubadour that Marco Brew, who is an austere moralist and satirist, hates. But he's also precisely the kind of troubadour that Eleanor, the Queen of France, liked. And I'm now going to pass over to Emma to talk a bit about the music. Thank you. Well, troubadour songs were conceived to be sung. Indeed, singing about singing is a recurring topic in this repertory. And as Simon said, Marco Brood's canzo pointedly announces that it is to be sung abroad to transmit its rumours about Eleanor. So when Simon sought me out to help with the performance of Marco Bruce's song, I was initially very happy and then almost immediately crestfallen. And that is because while many copies of Marco Bruce's text survive in manuscripts from the 13th and 14th century, none at all survive which contain evidence of the melody. This is actually not very surprising. Very few troubadour songs survive with their melodies. It's only something like 10% of the total repertory. And the primary medium for transmission and preservation of these songs in the 12th century was the memory and the voice of the troubadour himself. So faced with the limits of evidence, I got wondering how one would set about singing a song which has no voice, and also how one would perform sarcasm. That was initially Simon's um, question to me. So what's going to follow is an experiment. A common practice around the time when the troubadour songs were first written down was for musicians to reuse melodies, stripping out texts and replacing them with new ones to re-sing songs in different guises. This is what we call an act of contrafactum. When wondering whether we might borrow a melody, I got thinking then about Jean Ferré Roudel, who, as Simon explained, is something like the poster child for the courtly troubadour and the target for Marco Bruce's song. So taking a look at Quand les Rios de la Fontana found the perfect foil to Marco Bruce's song, but also, very pragmatically, I found um, a song whose form is very similar, in fact, to, this, to the form of Marco Bruce's song. So then some interesting possibilities arose. And so I began with the melody of Jaffray's song and used that to develop a melody for Marco Bruce's song. So there's a little bit of adaptation, and one of the wet things that I've done is, um, while Jaffray's song, as you'll hear, feels very directed and feels very sort of solidly like it has a sense of musical home, I've adjusted um, that melody a little bit um, to make um, Marco Bruce's version of this song feel a little bit more unsettled, less stable. 
There's also then the question of voice. Um, melody is really just one parameter of a song. Um, and in fact, the tone and the timbre of individual singers seems to have been a source of fascination for troubadours. Markaboo himself reflects on qualities of the voice or voz. And troubadours reflect that voices can be good, bad, ugly, they can sound like nightingales, they can sound like the drying goat skin in the sunshine, whatever that sounds like. These are, of course, the unscriptable, unrecordable aspects of song that we can only speculate about. But in preparing their performances, Matthew and Joey have been very game to try out, with their own voices, um, to, um, some of these unscriptable qualities of the songs. Now what we're going to do now is hear two, these two songs back to back. We're going to start with Joey, who is going to sing for us four stanzas of Jaffre's Conlevius de la Fontana. He's going to sing the first, which is the, um, the inspiration to song. Um, a second stanza where he longs for the lady from afar, a third where he melts with desire for her, and a fourth where he, like Markabru, dispatches his song into the world to do its work. We're going to follow it immediately with Markabru's riposte, again selecting just a few of the stanzas in, in your books. We're going to begin again with that opening call for song. Then there'll be two mock lectures on song and the art of loving. Then listen out for the scandalous insinuations about Eleanor of Aquitaine, where Matthew's going to um, develop some interesting melodic tricks at this point. And finally, he'll pointedly dispatch the song back to Jaufre and the French Outremar.
pronunciation of these songs, um, it's very difficult for the singers to inhabit these songs in this unfamiliar language and this unfamiliar diction. So thank you, Simon. So in the examples that we just heard, uh, we experienced how music serves a way of broadcasting messages, making words loud, clear, memorable, and mobile. Music can also be the ideal medium for transmitting slanderous insinuations without them necessarily being understood. Imagine music then as a kind of sonic Trojan horse, smuggling in controversial messages by distorting words in the act of performing them. This is the premise of our next example, a four-part motet composed in northern France in the early decades of the 13th century. In this piece, we now have a kind of musical capability that permits multiple perspectives sincere or mocking, to be sounded simultaneously. We're going to hear different voices singing different texts at the same time. And to begin with, I'd like us just to experience the sound world of the polytextual motet. So I'm going to invite the singers to join. Joey 
different from all of that. 
So what I suggest the music is doing in these songs is helping to construct the reputation of gossip itself as something that is trivial, unworthy, and idle, as women's talk, in fact. Something that is entertaining and amusing for higher class men to talk about or sing about. The first song that we're going to listen to you is by Pierre Serpon. Um, and its refrain is the classic refrain of the gossip. Oh, I'm saying it's terrible. So this refrain mimics the kind of feigned reluctance that the gossip kind of traffics in. The kind of feigned reluctance that sort of draws you in, makes you lean a little bit closer, makes you complicit, in fact, in what is being said. So it's like a kind of rhetoric of secrecy
song itself had a very interesting street life. We know it was sung on the streets of Venice, and the you'll hear it has a very bobbing, jaunty, yet somehow kind of mocking refrain, bonk, 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 which was used in a satirical song about the king's mistress when he temporarily left her for another woman. So it had that kind of life, or I think the refrain, the music had a life of its own um, outside of this kind of very courtly setting, or the setting of the court. And you could argue that the song itself was disseminated through the kind of gossip networks that it makes fun of. Because it does make fun of gossip networks, and in particular, of a particular women gossiping. Um, while these wives are telling each other how their husbands feed the chickens, the melody transforms them into chickens, and their words into nothing more human or elevated or interesting than a chicken's cluck. Listen at it, it's a cuckoo duck, cuckoo duck. And in fact, it's something that's already happened in that refrain I was talking about, the bon bon bon. It's not a kind of meaningful um, sound when it's repeated so often. It just turns into, yeah, it just turns into noise. <coughs> Um, and this now as well for the petite coquette. This might be the husband or the wife talking to the chickens, but far more likely it's suggesting the wife's travesty, the assumption of the husband's rights. So they have become little female cocks with all that that implies, including the slight suggestion of cuckoldy. Um, so I think what this does, the music working with the words, um, it neutralizes the potentially challenging nature of the gossip. So these women are challenging um, the hierarchy, the natural hierarchy the, of the patriarchy, but the music, even while they're doing that, is turning them, not very subtly, into chickens. Um, and all of this is happening while the music itself is getting more sophisticated. So again, separating itself, separating the singers, separating the listeners from the trivial nattering of the women is mimicking. This is Pierre Casabos, Il est Bellibon.
chase in this world. It's a crime that might be punished by making someone ride in a cart through the streets. So you'll hear carts refer to often in what follows. And a more informal punishment might be scratching a paw on her face or attacking her nose. The words of insult also included many other concerns that you'll hear about the Roman war, how men's money was spent, and what nasty secrets women might have in their hidden pasts. The fleeting words of street talk often drawing on proverbs and biblical texts lasted a very long time in local memory, and months later the witnesses were able to recapitulate them to the church court in St. Paul's Cathedral. Thank you. 